Jerry, probably you know the website. You can go on. Huh? I'll check the whole church. Yeah. So you can go online and you can check to see if your signature's been accepted or if it's been rejected on your, uh, your ballot. I'm live. Okay. Hi, everybody. We're talking about the election that's coming up. We are, what, nine days away? Yeah. So if you haven't voted, you need to vote. And uh, so I'm not going <clears> to... <throat> It's uh, it's our patriotic duty. You know, it's one thing. I'll just say this: it's what really bothers me is when, after the election, you hear that upwards of thirty percent of Christians who are registered to vote don't vote. And if we would just get out and vote, we could move the country towards biblical principles. Like I tell people, I'm not a Republican or a Democrat. I'm a biblically based constitutional conservative. And so this is, this is our textbook. This is our guide. So we've, we follow the scripture. And because uh, uh, there's people in the Republican Party I don't really like either. And sometimes between Republican and Democrat, it's the, it's the best of two evils. And I hate, hate that. So, but Getting off that, off that, so make sure you vote. We have been on a, a series here, and an ancient Jewish wedding ceremony. Uh, as I shared back in the beginning, is that everything God does, there is a, a, a reason, there's a principle, there's, there is order to everything. God is not random. Uh, this world tends to be random, but God is very orderly. And when they found, uh, <coughs> well, one of the things was when uh, Darwin came out with his thesis, you know, of evolution and stuff. He even made a statement that one, if they find out more information later on, then his thesis would go away. Well, the, what they found out was we have DNA, and that DNA is a programming. It's a whole program of who we are, our ancestry, everything that programs the color of our skin, our hair, our height, all that stuff. And so it, it throws away evolution. So God is a God of order. And so understanding the ancient Jewish wedding ceremony gives us an idea of there is a plan, and we are in a sequence of this plan that God has for you and I. And so... We, we covered this, so we're in part three today, so it's on Facebook Live. It's also, I posted on YouTube under Island View Worship Center. You can go back and you, if you're just watching this for the first time and get caught up. So I'll just quickly go through, but it's because today is in part three is, is there's a, a glorious transformation that's coming, and it's the restoration of the lost. And this is, last night as I was sleeping, I wake up and the Lord begins to during the night and downloads things into me and stuff and and it was just like the glorious transformation restoration of that which was lost and I'll just say this is that thought that came to me from the Lord is God is restoring us back to what Adam and Eve lost in the garden the relationship that they had with the Lord who they were was lost to us and we are we are living in a fallen state. These bodies are not the bodies that they have and, and stuff. And so we are living out the consequence of that fall. And so we are in a state today of regeneration, restoration, and God is restoring mankind back to Himself. <clears throat> but in Revelations 19, 7 and 8, it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and gave him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come. His wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine women, linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So here it's telling us that there is a wedding that's coming. And many of us already know that we, the body of Christ, who accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are the bride of Christ. And so this is, there's so many indications that we're in this, this wedding process. So real quickly, number one is the selection of the bride. The bridegroom would select the, the, 
the bride. And so Jesus said, this is his words, you did not choose me, I chose you. That's in John 15, 13. So he chose us. He chose to come to the earth to restore relationship with us back to God, but he chose us to be with them. I chose you and appointed you that you should go forth and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and that whatever you ask in mind, ask in the Father in my name, he will give to you. So he chose us. The next thing was the arrangement. And so this is what uh, was, what's the bride price. The, the bridegroom would come to the family and says, I want to marry your daughter. And this is what I'm going to offer for her. Because she was a functioning part of the family. And back then, families was everything, every person was needed for survival of the family. And we were just talking earlier about like uh, people who, pioneers and those that lived here in this area during cold weather years ago, this time of year, it's all about survival. And you need the whole family functioning. So if you lose a, fa- a, a family member to marriage, there was a, a, a bride price that was given. Well, the bride price that was given for us was the blood of Jesus. So I'm going to die for you and shed my blood for the remission of your sins so that you can have relationship with the Father. That was the price, the arrangement that he was willing to make to us. And so, and, uh, and <clears throat> the documentation of that is the Word of God, the Bible, the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament is for, for Israel, New Testament pertains to us, as his contract to us. The consent of the bride, the bride then must give her consent. She, must, she has an opportunity to say yes or, yea or nay. She has a choice. And God does not force us to accept him. It's a free will. And I, I choose to the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I choose him. I said yes. And so we talked about that earlier. Then, it was, uh, then there was a cup that was, was shared. And this cup is the, the Lord's Supper. It's the sealing of the covenant that we do today. That cup that they took at, at the... Uh, when Jesus was with his disciples, before he went to the cross, he drank, it was the third cup, and I, I talked about that later. But so there was a cup, and so in the, the, when we take the, the Lord's Supper, we are remembering that cup of covenant that we took. And, and young uh, men and women, uh, when they have a, a wedding, and we'll have a table up here, and a lot of times they will share the cup together, the bread, the communion, again. So this is... This, a lot of these traditions is carried on. So then the broom then uh, gives the bride gifts, and that we focused on that last week uh, uh, quite a bit. The Lord wanted me to focus on the gifts, and so today when uh, the, the bridegroom would accept, what then the, uh, the groom would give her, a, today it's an a, 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 a engagement ring. And so that's marks that she is, she is spoken for. She is, she's committed to someone else, that engagement ring. But, <clears throat> but what the Lord has given us, and we talked about this last week, is all of the gifts. He gave us the Holy Spirit. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came down and dwelt in them. He said the Holy Spirit will be in you. He don't dwell in buildings. He dwells in us. We are the habitation of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has given us gifts. And so just nine of the gifts we shared last week is the, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the gift of healing, uh, faith, uh, working of miracles, prophecy, uh, discerning of spirits, uh, device, diverse types of tongues, and interpretation of tongues. So one of these, 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 these gifts we really need today is, this, is discernment. What's all going on in the world today, Lord, we need discernment more than ever before. What is right, what is wrong, and stuff. So these were gifts that were given to us. And, and as the, the engagement ring was evidence of someone being uh, spoken for, these gifts, every time we see the gifts of the Spirit functioning, it is evidence that Jesus is coming back for us. That He sealed what in us and gave us the promise of His return. So, <clears throat> that's where we finished up last week. So the next step would be the washing, the mikvah. Uh, 
which we would call today is baptism, water baptism. And so in Ephesians 5, 25 through 27, Husbands, love your wife, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. And then Acts 2, 38 through 39, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the, the name of the Lord Jesus for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is to you and to your children and to those who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. This is us. It's not just you that are here today, but everyone that's afar off. Well, we're the ones that are far off. So this word is, is as valid for us as it was for them, them years ago. So this washing, how many of uh, you remember the story of Esther? Before she could go into the king, it was like a year of cleansing and washing, bathing in perfume and all these things in preparation for her entrance into the king. And then the king would, would accept her. So that, there's lots of types and shadows. So I just want to quickly go over what it, it refers to spots, not having any spots. Spots are defilement, things that, that we allow ourselves to be defiled. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, it was real popular Ouija board. And some of you probably know about Ouija boards. Well, you think it's just a fun game. But behind that is demonic forces that are moving that. My dad used to do a thing that he could uh, do this thing where it would levitate tables. And we thought, oh, ain't this cool? Well, now I know that was defilement. That was appropriating demonic forces, demonic things. And so defilement is, I don't do anything like that anymore. I don't want to participate in anything like that because I want to be separate from these things that seem so innocent, but their roots go back to demonic forces. So no spot. Uh, we have uh, no wrinkle, no hidden sin. Things that are hidden. Things that I, you know, I would hide from my wife or I'd hide from the church or uh, you hear... Uh, uh, people that are having an affair on the side and their wife doesn't even know it, the family doesn't even know it, our pastors even having these things. Our uh, pastors, some known as pastors that are embezzling money from the church and different things. These are hidden sins. And so, <coughs> that's the wrinkles. We don't want any of that. We have to be totally up front because all of this is not out of, I want to focus again just for a moment, this is not out of law. We don't do these out of law. The law is under the Old Testament. We, I don't want to be defiled. I don't want to have hidden sin because of my love for my Savior. My love for my husband. Now, ladies, you can be, you, today, Scripture talks about we're the sons of God. So, on the earth, we're the, all the sons of God. But I am also a bride. So, this, these things are not gender specific. So, we are, uh, we don't want the, to do these things because and have these hidden sins because we have a love relationship with the Lord. Same as I have a love relationship with my wife, because of that love, I am not going to commit adultery. I'm not going to go out and do things that defile that relationship. And so that's, that's what this is. It's not out of law. It's out of love. Because of my love for my Savior, my Lord Jesus Christ, I don't have spots. I don't, I'm not defiled. I don't have wrinkles. Uh, we must be holy, inwardly pure. I want to walk a pure life before the Lord. Uh, we must not have no blemish, which is out, uh, we are outwardly pure. Uh, and so what happens is I, as used to be in construction, I, I could have a pretty foul language sometimes. I don't do that anymore. Because I want to be outwardly pure. I want to set examples. Sometimes we slip, but if it says, John says, if any of us sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We say, Lord, forgive me. I didn't mean to do that. 
My old nature slipped out there for a moment. And number five, this is a, a part of keeping our garments white that we, we want to keep pure before the Lord. We want to walk in purity before Him because we love Him. Number eight, after this engagement, the bride, uh, bridegroom departs. He goes to the Father's house and uh, he would build an addition onto the Father's house. And only the Father could say, you can go get your bride now. He couldn't just throw up a shack. It had to be something that the Father said, this is appropriate for your bride. And so we can see in, in John 14, 2 through uh, 3, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am you shall be also. So it's, and then also in Matthew 24, 36, only the Father, God, knows the time of Christ's return. Jesus didn't know, the Father knows. And so, so that's the state we're at, is the Lord is preparing a place for us. We're here at this time, walking in a state of consecration, fulfilling the ministry that God has given to us. Each one of us are called to fulfill a purpose that we're not here just sitting and uh, taking up space, but God has called each one of us, given us gifts, talents, abilities to share the gospel, to, to speak with people, to love people, to pray for people, to, enter, uh, to let our light shine in the midst of darkness. So, until that day that He comes for us. And so that's the state we're in right now, is the state of, of walking consecrated before the Lord. Looking forward to his return. That's number 10. The return of the bridegroom. That day that he comes back for us. The bridegroom could not return without the father's permission. Most bridegrooms would return return late at night. The return was often in secret, sudden, and unannounced. The bridegroom's father knew when this, the chamber was ready, and the bridegroom would send his groomsmen in advance ahead of his revival. In Matthew 25, 6, And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. There would be trumpets, blasts, there would be all kinds of... He would know that the bridegroom is coming. And at this, in the Song of Solomon, it's uh, tap, chapter 2, verses uh, 10 through 13, it says, My beloved spoke and said to me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone, the flowers appear in the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in the land. The fig tree puts forth its green, green figs, and the vines with the tender grapes give a good, <coughs> which uh, give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. So uh, Solomon was talking about this picture of the bride coming away. That's us. The rapture. And I've said this before, there's big controversy, or rapture is not in the Bible, all this kind of stuff. And I don't want to get, I don't want to get in, hung up in the weeds with that. The rapture is, is uh, taken from the word herpazo, which means catching away. A catching away, Latin for catching away is rapture, raptora. And that's where the, the word rapture comes from. So we're talking about the catching away. The bridegroom's come in and we're caught away to meet the Lord in the air. And so, uh, in Matthew 24, 42 says, Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. This was Jesus speaking. Matthew 25, 13, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Mark 13, 33, Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when that time is. And Luke 12, 30, 37, Blessed are, are those servants 
whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. But surely I say unto you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. So here is a sudden thing that's going to be going to happen. <clears throat> There's a doctrine of the doctrine of imminence. It goes clear back to the, the founding fathers. Uh, Ignatius, uh, Polycarp, those that were set under John and the other disciples believed in this doctrine of imminence that Jesus could come at any time because we don't know when he can come. And stuff. So, always living. Well, and, and there's people out there that teach that, well, if you're, if you're thinking that Jesus is going to come, this rapture thing is going to happen. Well, then, all you're looking for is Jesus to come back, and so you're not about the business of, uh, of the gospel. I, I believe that's totally, totally a misconception. If I know that Jesus could come back any time, I'm more concerned about talking to my kids. I'm more concerned about talking to my friends. I don't want to, well, I'll do it next year, because that doesn't look like the Lord's going to come back for a while. We don't know when he's going to come back. So there should be an urgency in our heart to share with those around us, those we love, those we care about, to share the gospel. And so it, this doctrine of imminence, I believe it's important because here he says, you don't know when it's going to happen. There's, you have no clue when it's going to happen. It's when the Father says, go, go. We can see the season, and I've shared this before, the season that we're in, we're coming up in... It's about uh, 2027 is the, two th the, uh, the 2,000 year of Jesus dying on the cross. And that's from rabbis saying that Jesus died or was birthed approximately 6 B.C. Well, so that puts 2027 that we're coming up as 2,000 years. So we're living in a season that it's, it, it could happen any time. We don't know when it's going to happen. So we should be about the Father's business every day. Every day. This is the glorious transformation the Lord was dealing with me last, last night. That this transformation, when He comes to us and we're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, we are transformed. We are instantaneously transformed from this natural to supernatural. In 1 Corinthians 15, 42-44 so also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown in natural. It is raised, raised in spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. I believe when this happens, that instantaneously transformation that we will be back where Adam and Eve were, or maybe even better. I don't know what's, what it's going to be like, but we are going to be changed from natural to supernatural. <clears throat> I, I, I don't know about you, I'm looking for that day. I'm looking for that day. I'm looking for that day. But my prayer has been, I, I would love to see this happen tomorrow. But my prayer is, Lord, give us a little more time, please. There's some people that we, we have to win yet. There's some people we need to touch. Lord, give us a little more time, please. Oh, I'd, Lord, I would love this. Personally, I would love it right now. No more pain, no more aches, no more growing old. You can travel at the speed of thought. You can, Jesus, the room was closed and Jesus appeared to him in the room. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go see my mom and dad. Poof, I'm over there. No matter where, they could be over in, in, uh, Italy somewhere. I'm gonna go see him. Poof, I'm there. This is what's look, this is, this is what's before us. That this transformation that begins to take place in our life. Lord, I want to be with you, but Lord, please give us a little more time. Please give us a little more time. First Thessalonians 4, 15, 18. 
For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep, those who are, uh, have gone on before us. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the shout. This is the bridegroom coming. With the voice of the archangels and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. You want to comfort some people today? That's, that's the comfort. That's what we're looking forward to. The glorious being caught up to meet the Lord in the air. When's it going to happen? Tomorrow? It could. Next week? It could. Next year? It could. Five years? It could. I don't know, but i got to live my life as if He's coming today. I can't live my life as... Well, I'll go out and I'll do some partying and I'll just, I'll live it up for a while. Because I know when that, that trumpet sounds, I'll get on my knees. And, no, you won't. It will happen so fast, you won't have any time to come back to the Lord. If you walked away from God, see, it's, I was just talking to someone this week. It was, it was yesterday. There's a doctrine out there that says, once saved, you're always saved. And so it means you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have your fire insurance, and you can go out and live like hell because you bought your fire insurance, you're okay. Well, that's not the way it works. What I just read to you here is I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I love Him, and I want to be the best I can be for Him. But God is never takes away our free will. And I, I, I've read of different worship leaders in very prominent churches who are walked away from the gospel. Nothing to do with that church stuff anymore. They've walked away. Pastors who have walked away. First question is, did you ever have it to begin with? But I don't know. But God has given us a free will. We can choose. And what he tells us, that he wants us because we want to be with him. God is not forcing anybody to accept him. He said, here it is. Here's the program right here. This is what you'll have, and, what, and this is the results, what I just read here. But the choice is up to me. I can accept it or reject it. I have free will, and I can walk away from this tomorrow, and I can go live the way I want to live, do what I want to do. Am I going to make it? Well, I've told people, well, I hope so, but I, I can't guarantee you're going to make it. I don't understand the grace and the, glo uh, and the presence of God. I don't understand everything about God. But I know if we are walking in Him, and, and, and John said it, that if we, make, if we sin, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous, that we repent of our sins. He said if, if a person says he doesn't sin, he's a liar because we all sin. We all come up short. We have, but it's in our heart, Lord, I want to do the best I can. I want to be the best I can for you. I want to live for your kingdom. But if I willfully choose to go walk away, I willfully choose to walk into the world again and reject everything about God, this Bible stuff is garbage. It's all, they're, all they're doing is they're indoctrinating you. And I begin to speak against this. Am I saved? I hope so. But like I said, I, I, I don't understand the grace of God. But I do know we have eternal security in Him if our life is, and our heart is after God. If we make a mistake, it's okay. He's there to pick us up. He's there to walk with us through it, to get us back on track again. And not saying that there's times that we've gone through uh, loss of a business or a divorce and stuff, and really down, we're really low. It's like a story of a young man, his wife died. And he was with his dad, and his dad says, we need to pray. And his son said, Dad, I, don't, I can't pray. 
I don't know. I can't pray. And his dad said, it's okay, son. I'll pray for both of us. See, that's why we need the body of Christ. That's why we need each other. That's why the Scripture says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves, especially as you see that day approaching. Because we need each other. We need to encourage one another. If we're someone, a brother or sister is struggling, come alongside them. What's going on? Can I pray with you? Can I intercede? We're going to pray for Jenny. Ray, his, his granddaughter. Over seven weeks in hospital in Spokane. Infections inside of her. And it's going from one infection to another infection to another infection. Then I asked Ray, how's she doing? It's not good. It's time for the body of Christ to rise up and, and intercede and pray. Come along. Parents are up there. They can't work because they're with their daughter. She's 18 years old. And so we need to encourage. We need to pray. We need the gifts of the Spirit. Lord, we pray for healing. And right now, Lord, I pray for Jenny in Jesus' name. I pray the power of the Holy Spirit on her in this hospital room. Lord, whatever the source of this infection is that's going on inside her, I rebuke that infection right now in Jesus' name. I, Lord, I pray that her organs would begin to function. The blood will begin to purify. Everything will work be, according to your plan for Jenny. Lord, you have a destiny. Your hand is upon her, Lord God. And this is not her destiny. And Lord, whatever outside influence, Lord, that might be upon her, Lord. Lord... In anything, Lord, you know what's going on. I pray the power of your Holy Spirit would come upon her, that you would encourage her in her spirit, encourage her with her faith. Lord, I pray for her parents, Ben and Linda. I pray for them. Encourage them. I pray for their family, the, the other kids, Lord. I pray, Lord, as they intercede and pray for their, for their sister and daughter, Lord. I, we come around them in prayer, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord. In you there's neither space nor time, Lord God. And we pray... Lord, that she be healed. And we declare healing for Jenny right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, there's a glorious transformation coming. That we will be changed. We will be transformed. But there's a glorious transformation that's happening right now in people's lives. Right here in earth. If you ever ministered to something, who, someone who had been lost, who had been in sin, who had been in drugs, who had been bound up by this world, and you see the glorious transformation that comes over them and the change, it's powerful. And God is not waiting just for us to go to heaven. It's happening right here and now. And He's saying to us, will you partner with me now? Will you work with me now? Because now is the time that we need to step up. Hallelujah. Tomorrow we, or next week, we'll talk about going, going off to, to heaven with the Lord. But right now, I think it's a, it's a focus that we need to focus on right now. Yes, the Lord's coming back. He's, going to, he's coming back glorious and signs of the time. Israel is ready to build the, the temple. Uh, things in Israel are uh, been restored. Peace treaties are breaking out all over Israel. Another one was signed this week. There are things that are happening, but we see the world is in chaos right now. America is in chaos. Things are just turned upside. Right is wrong and wrong is right. And uh, you, you try to talk with people. Uh, used to be Republican and Democrat. You could get together and talk and uh, be friends. I've worked with a lot of different guys. You could be friends, just agree to disagree. But now it's like, I'm for President Trump. You bigot, you homophobia. It's a rage comes over people. What's, what are we dealing with today? What are we dealing with? It's a spiritual war we're in. It's spiritual. The enemy does not want to give up. Satan still thinks he's going to win. And he still thinks he's going to overthrow America.
but not on my watch. Not on my watch, because I'm going to pray and I'm going to intercede. I'm going to go to go to battle right now on my knees. That's why tonight we at six o'clock we pr- we're praying for the nation. We've been doing that since September. Wednesday night we've been almost four and a half years praying on Wednesday night, interceding for this nation, interceding and praying for transformation, change, praying for the state of Washington, praying. And talking to people. Talking to people. Yes. One day this war will be over. And God will say to Jesus, it's time. The church ages will be done. Their time is up. Bring them home. And Jesus will come back with the angels and the trump of God will sound and we will caught up to beat the Lord in the air and we will forever be with the Lord. That is, when that happens, this might be kind of crude, but I believe that's when the oh crap revival happens. People that we've witnessed to, family members that we've witnessed to, All of a sudden, the church is gone. Oh, crap. They were right. They were right. And what happens? The Scripture tells us that when John is in heaven in Revelation, he saw a vast multitude under the throne of God. And he said, who are these? And he said, these are the ones that came out of the tribulation. They died for their faith. So, the one thing that we can always hold on to is that God loves you more than you can realize. And He says that He would that none would be lost and that all would be saved. When people, if someone comes up to you and says, Why does God send people to hell? This is your response. God sends no one to hell. He will put himself between you and hell multiple times. Even those people that have walked away from God, have left ministry, God will still put himself between them and hell multiple times where they've had to step over, step around, step through. They have to reject God multiple times So when they are in hell, they are there because they chose to be there. They rejected everywhere that God tried to keep them from that. Hell was not made for you and I. It was made for the devil and his angels and for those who choose to go there. God wants us all in heaven and he will do everything in his power. I could tell you all kinds of stories I've heard of people that died and it came back to life and stuff, and they've had encounters with God, and supernatural things happened in people's lives, that God was every step of the way trying to keep them from in he- going to hell. So if a person goes to hell, it's because they've chose to go there. Because they have rejected the one thing that would keep them out, and that was Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's, let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your presence. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you are working in us. Lord, I praise you and I thank you, Lord, that we have a glorious hope. And you said that, look up, our redemption's drawing near. Lord, we know that it's, it could happen any time. But Lord, I pray again, give us time. Help us to touch people. Help us to win people to you, Lord. Help us to minister to people. Lord, we pray the power of your Holy Spirit would begin to move. Move in different ways. Lord, we're praying for revival. We're praying for a great awakening. We're praying for a move. And Lord, I pray right now, Lord, what I'm seeing out <clears throat> in, in a culture, Lord, what we see is a, as a political movement. Lord, I pray that's the beginning of a spiritual movement, a supernatural movement, Lord. 
Lord, for the glory of God to re- reap the harvest. A great harvest is coming, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, lead us, guide us, each one of us, every day. Lord, to those people you would have us to talk to. Lord, those people you would have us to share with. Lord, we pray for your presence, Lord, to be with us as we go. Lord, we pray the power of your Holy Spirit. Just be on each one of us, Lord. Those that are watching by video, Lord, Lord, those of us that are here, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that your will will be done in the earth, Lord, until that day you come back. Lord, for those that don't know you, Lord, I pray that they accept you as their Lord and Savior. They invite you, you into their heart. Just say, Lord Jesus, I accept you into my heart. I ask you to be my Lord and Savior. Come and fill me with your presence. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And that's all it takes is to invite him into your heart. No matter how broken you are, how far you are away from God, invite him in and he will come and the Holy Spirit will come. And then after that happens, find someone, find a brother and sister, come, go to a church, a good church. Uh, you know, and Lord, I pray, lead them. Lead them to who you want them to share with. And uh, partner together, because the body of Christ is here to be partners with one another. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence today. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah.